December 1942. Across America's great industrial cities, the thunder of production shook the ground. The M4 Sherman tank, America's armored workhorse, rolled off assembly lines faster than any tank in history. Between 1942 and 1945, over 50,000 Shermans emerged from Detroit, Cleveland, and Chicago. It was a triumph of mass production, proof that democracy's factories could outbuild fascisms. Yet beneath that celebration of steel and fire lay a flaw so devastating that tank crews gave it a nickname they would whisper in fear. Ronson, the cigarette lighter that lights first time, every time. The Sherman, they joked grimly, lived up to that slogan. British troops called it the Tommy Cooker. Neither name appeared in any official report, but the letters home from North Africa and Italy told the truth. Men were burning alive inside the tanks that were supposed to protect them. The problem wasn't just thin armor, as so many believed. It was how that armor was joined together. The welds, those invisible seams binding the hull plates, had a hidden weakness. When a German 80 outer in meter shell struck the right point, those welds tore open before the armor itself gave way, venting a blast of superheated gas and molten fragments into the crew compartment. Within seconds, fuel, ammunition, and hydraulic fluid ignited, turning the Sherman into a furnace. Crews had barely 90 seconds to escape, if they weren't wounded, and if the hatches weren't jammed. Reports from battles like Kasserine Pass in early 1943 made it clear Shermans were brewing up from hits that should have been survivable. Commanders demanded better guns and thicker armor. Washington sent sandbags and white phosphorus shells instead. Nobody suspected the welds. The unglamorous, unseen joints made far from the battlefield. To the procurement officers in charge, a weld was a weld. If it met the specifications on the paperwork, it was good enough. But those specifications, written back in 1941, had been designed for speed, not survival. Meanwhile, the weapon destroying those tanks, the German 8.8 semi-operator Flak 18, had evolved into the deadliest anti-tank gun of the war. Originally designed to shoot bombers from the sky, the 88 became infamous after the Spanish Civil War, when German gunners discovered it could pierce any tank on Earth. Firing the Panzer Granite 39 shell at nearly 2,700 feet per second, it could punch through 110 millimeters of steel at a kilometer's distance. The Sherman's sloped 51 millimeter frontal armor gave it an effective resistance of only 90 millimeters. Do the math. Even from a mile away, an 88 could kill a Sherman with ease. From the side, where armor thinned to 38 meters, to 38 millimeters, the Sherman might as well have been made of paper. The result was carnage. At Kasserine Pass, a handful of German 88s wiped out 40 American tanks in under an hour. At Villers Bocage in France, one German unit destroyed over 50 Allied vehicles in 15 minutes. The 88's low silhouette, rapid fire rate, and uncanny accuracy turned them into invisible executioners. But what made the gun truly terrifying was how easily it exploited the Sherman's weak welds. Even glancing blows that should have deflected were splitting the tank's seams. The man who would change that wasn't an officer or an engineer. He was Thomas Wilder, a 52-year-old welder from Detroit's River Rouge shipyard. Wilder had spent his life welding Great Lakes freighters, massive hulls that had to survive storms and shifting ice. When a shipyard contract ended in 1943, the Army reassigned him to Chrysler's tank arsenal in Warren, Michigan. The moment he saw the Army's butt-weld specifications, his instincts screamed that something was wrong. Shipbuilders used double V-joints, fusing plates completely from both sides. The Army wanted only 75% penetration, faster, cheaper, and easier to inspect. But to Wilder, that unfused route left a hidden crack, a stress point waiting to fail. He proved it one cold night that December. 
Sneaking into the test range after hours, Wilder convinced a friendly sergeant to fire a captured 75mm German shell at a welded test plate. The weld split wide open. Not the armor, the weld. Wilder knew he was right. The Army's perfect welds were creating fatal weak points. So, against every regulation, he welded a new test plate his way. A double V-joint welded from both sides, fully fused. When they hit that plate with an 80 dt millimeter shell, the result stunned them both. The armor cratered, but the seam held. No crack, no gap. The weld was stronger than the plate itself. Metallurgy explained why. The Army's one-sided welds left internal tension and a weak heat-affected zone. Under impact, that unfused root acted like a zipper, tearing open under stress. Wilder's double V joint eliminated that discontinuity, distributing force evenly through the entire seam. But his solution faced an impossible obstacle. Bureaucracy. His method tripled weld time, required flipping plates, violated inspection standards, and technically breached Chrysler's contract with the War Department. He would be fired, or worse, if he tried it on production tanks. So Wilder went underground. In early 1944, he shared his findings with Captain Robert Chen, a visiting maintenance officer from the 2nd Armored Division. Chen immediately recognized what this meant. His own unit's Shermans had been splitting at the seams in Italy. He carried Wilder's hand-drawn diagrams back to Europe in his duffel bag and gave them to Master Sergeant Frank Kowalski, a battle-hardened welder running the division's repair company. Kowalski began secretly applying Wilder's technique to damaged Shermans, repairing hulls with full-penetration double-V welds. When the repaired tanks returned to battle, the results were undeniable. Tanks that had once brewed up from glancing hits now survived direct strikes. Commanders noticed. By the summer of 1944, as the Allies fought through the hedgerows of Normandy, modified Shermans were lasting longer under fire. In Lieutenant Colonel James Bates's battalion, Shermans with Wilder's welds had an 85% survival rate compared to 58% for standard tanks. The difference wasn't luck. It was metallurgy and courage. The Pentagon's inspectors soon caught on discovering discrepancies in welding supply reports. Kowalski was reprimanded and ordered to stop. His reply was simple. Come see the tanks. When the colonel saw rows of surviving Shermans next to burned-out ones, he quietly told Kowalski, Keep doing it, but don't write it down. By the fall of 1944, field welders across France were using Wilder's method, ignoring the manuals. The results spoke for themselves. Hundreds of tanks saved, thousands of lives spared. After the war, the official record remained silent. No medals, no headlines, but the Army's 1946 welding standards quietly changed, mandating full penetration welds and dual side inspection, exactly what Wilder had done in secret. When the M46 Patton entered combat in Korea, its welds held strong. By the 1960s, Wilder's principle, the seam must never be the weak point, had become standard worldwide. Every modern tank, from the Leopard to the Abrams, carries his legacy in every weld bead. Thomas Wilder retired in 1949, anonymous. His contribution buried in classified reports and metallurgical manuals. But the truth endures in steel. His illegal welds became the foundation of modern armor construction. In the end, the story of the M4 Sherman isn't just about flawed machines or deadly guns. It's about one man who trusted his experience over authority and by breaking the rules saved the lives of men who never even knew his name.